Gios might have started out as a blessing, but no power comes without consequences or risk. It didn't take long after these consequences manifested before Lelouch realized just how cursed and lonely the king's power could be. These burdens grew so heavy that Lelouch missed several key opportunities to use his Gios to eliminate troublesome obstacles. At the start, Lelouch didn't really have to care about the consequences of his actions. All the losses and all the casualties were important, but Lelouch always viewed them like a general would view casualty reports after a battle. He didn't spend time agonizing over any civilians he might have killed, any of his men that he sent to die. He viewed his Gios in the same way. The power to twist someone's mind is evil. Lelouch knows this. But it's a necessary evil, like taking life to sustain oneself. Lelouch was embarking on the path of blood, and was prepared to take advantage of any tool he had to use. Still, Lelouch did have some qualms on how he would use his Gios. That's why he didn't just Gios all the Black Knights to be loyal to him and call it a day. Before we get started, head to the comments and answer this question. Did Lelouch's Gios evolve and become more powerful over time? Or was it just his willingness to use it, or lack thereof, that evolved? And is there even any difference? My name is Zero, this is Kato, and today let's talk about the time Lelouch stopped using his Gios. Lelouch's guilt for his actions seriously began in stage 12. Lelouch held Shirley, a girl he loved, as she cried into his arms. Cried because she lost her father at the hands of Zero. For the first time, Lelouch's actions have achieved such a far-reaching scale that he is made to feel guilt over the unexpected consequences of his own actions. They were still necessary, and he would probably do them again if he had to, but now it hurt. This is different from when he killed Clovis, which did cause remorse, but that was more of a physiological response and nothing like the chronic guilt that Lelouch comes to feel after harming a good man. This guilt only grew and turned its focus on Lelouch's Gios two episodes later, when he was forced to erase Shirley's memories. Losing Shirley hurt in a way that losing a battle doesn't. It's far more personal, as are the consequences. And thinking back, Lelouch had only gotten this far because of Gios. Maybe in another life, Shirley's father's blood was never on his hands. From then on, Lelouch was far more careful about using his Gios, only resorting to using it when he absolutely had to do so. The next time we see him use Gios is on C2, to keep her from going over to Mao. Given the context of the scene, it's likely that A, Lelouch was trying to protect her, and B, he was mostly sure it wouldn't work anyway. Because the core motivation is to protect here, Lelouch finds it acceptable as a last resort. I also just want to mention how cute it is that the only time Lelouch tried to Gios C2 was to keep her by his side. Then he used the Gios against Mao. He used it to permanently silence Mao's cruel words, only after he Giosed a police squad to shoot him. What's crucial here is that we only see Lelouch using his Gios against Mao. He uses it on the police off screen. Even though we usually see him using his Gios to set up his plans, they don't show it here. To show us that he is scheming, we just see Lelouch typing on a laptop doing his hacker man thing. So in terms of the Gios uses we see, after Shirley it's C2, then Mao. This obfuscation suggests to me that Lelouch's plan isn't about Gios anymore. His grander plan to eliminate Britannia, that is. He is only willing to use Gios against Gios. Lelouch clearly doesn't have any qualms about using his Gios against someone like Mao, who threatened C2 and Nunnally, and sent Suzaku into an existential crisis. The final example in this Gios war was when he used it on himself to outsmart Mao. The only ones who should shoot are those who are prepared to be shot. This is the moment when Lelouch really embraces how powerfully invasive the Gios truly is. And it cements in his mind that such a power should be wielded extremely carefully, or better yet, not at all. Sadly, what could have been a breakthrough for Lelouch to understand why the Gios is necessary only reinforced his negative perception that the power should be locked away. Reasonable in theory, but we know the consequences. After that, Lelouch is even more hesitant to use his Gios unless absolutely necessary. Lelouch has spent a considerable portion of the series either being foiled by Suzaku or trying to get him on his side. C2 even asks him why he doesn't just use his Gios on Suzaku already, but Lelouch doesn't even consider it. Even when the alternative might be to have to kill him. In his mind, using such an invasive power against Suzaku would mean the end of their friendship. And he's right. C2 asks if his refusal is because Suzaku is Lelouch's friend, or if it's because Lelouch is too prideful to use his Gios like this. He answers that it's both. 
If he is correct, he should be able to convince Suzaku somehow. In the end, Lelouch elects to not use his Gios. He would speak to Suzaku one more time, taking him prisoner is better than killing him, or using the cursed Gios on his friend. After careful planning, he finally has him. The Lancelot is disabled and all Lelouch has to do is convince Suzaku to join his side. This is when Schneisel finally springs his own trap, showing up in the Avalon. Schneisel must have noticed that Zero had already let two chances to end Suzaku pass by, even from across the world. Suzaku is ordered to keep Zero there, to die with him and end the rebellion once and for all. Here Lelouch tries his best to reason with his friend, pleading for both of their lives. Even as the Avalon charges an attack that will definitely wipe them both out, Lelouch still tries convincing Suzaku with words alone. Only when he has absolutely no choice at all does Lelouch use his Gios. Why did Lelouch choose to wait until the absolute last moment? It really does seem like Lelouch would rather try literally everything else first before resorting to using Gios at this point, especially against his friend. The way Lelouch uses the Gios, it's almost like an accident, like a kid instinctively hitting his friend during an argument. Even seconds away from death, Lelouch manages to contain himself. His command is to live. Given the situation they're in, it's entirely possible that Suzaku would have made it out, but Lelouch wouldn't have been able to. Being so pressed for time, Suzaku might have been forced by the Gios to injure Zero so he can control the Lancelot. This was a risk Lelouch was willing to take. A much safer command for him would have been something like, protect me. Yet Lelouch chooses something much riskier. He's putting Suzaku's safety first here. We of course know that the command to live is probably as cruel a command as Lelouch could have given to Suzaku. But this goes back to the childish argument they were having. When Suzaku says he would rather die than break the rules, something Lelouch knows he believes, he just gets so angry on his friend's behalf that he accidentally does something hurtful. Suzaku's selflessness has angered Lelouch more than once, but this is the most tragic instance of that through line. So he's actually trying to help Suzaku by bestowing him with this curse, much like how C2 helped him. It's a very direct reason for Suzaku to live. Even when forced to use his Gios, Lelouch tried to use it in the most benign way possible. Emphasis on tried. Cut to turn 18. So for us Gios trackers, we've seen him use it on Shirley in stage 14, then C2 in stage 15, then himself and Mao in stage 16, and then we get to this slip up with Suzaku in stage 18. Then we turn to stage 19, and this is where the trend gets even more apparent. When the Lucian Colin gets surrounded by Britannians, they manage to escape thanks to finding the Gawain. But before they even spot the nightmare and they fly out of the cave, Lelouch lays his eyes on Schneisel. This isn't obvious to us at the time, but Lelouch calls him out. Schneisel is the most dangerous person in the entire world, save for Lelouch and the Emperor himself. It didn't matter if Lelouch exposed himself in front of his friends, it didn't matter if everyone he gathered up to this point abandoned him. All he had to do was use his Gios on Schneisel right here, and he'd get his revenge sooner or later. It would have been trivial for him. Honestly, there are even ways Lelouch could have used his Gios that wouldn't have revealed he had a Gios at all. Just a simple, stay out of my way would have made the entirety of R2 much, much easier. Given the fact that Schneisel is the Prime Minister of Britannia, there should have been no hesitation when there was a chance to use Gios on him. Yet Lelouch doesn't do it. Why? Because of everything we've discussed. He executed Clovis right after subjecting him to Gios. It didn't have a chance to affect his brother in the long term. The love and respect he had for Schneisel in his past life must have been much more than what he felt for Clovis. Should he subject Schneisel to a worse fate? Even with Jeremiah, Lelouch didn't use a command that would control its target indefinitely. He's skittish about doing so, especially at this point. To Lelouch, this seemed like a bad opportunity because he didn't have the right phrase prepared or the right amount of privacy. And as we've discussed, there's a more important reason. His belief in his ability and his right to use the power of Gios has been wavering. Instead, Lelouch chooses to use military might, symbolized here by the new Gawain he's piloting. Even at the end of the episode, Lelouch apologizes for using his Gios on Suzaku, a Gios that he had absolutely no choice but to use for his own survival, and also one that would control its target indefinitely. Before we move on from Schneisel as a potential Gios victim, I want to move on to their next beating, the infamous chess game. 
The thing that Schneisel found out as a result of that chess game is in part meant to explain this moment. Schneisel is still coming to terms with the existence of Gios and supernatural powers throughout all of R1 and R2, but that chess game explains why Lelouch, or namely Zero, did not use Gios on Schneisel the second he laid eyes on him. It's because when the pressure gets too great, even for Lelouch, his powerful mind becomes a prison, and an ocean of thoughts swim about in his head. When Zero saw Schneisel on Kamine Island, he didn't have time to sort his thoughts out and realize the best use of his Gios, so instead he decided to lean on the strength of the Nightmare. This is also emblematic of where Lelouch is at this point in his life. The pressures of fighting his best friend and his beloved sister, trying to keep Nunnally close while pushing her away, and lying to almost everyone all the time. Lelouch can hardly spare a moment to think about how to use Gios. It's better not to wield such power thoughtlessly, especially now that his organization is strong enough to rival Cornelia without it. But can he really turn his back on Gios? After he promised C2 he would master it, is he allowed to do that? This new approach is somewhat validated in stage 20, when Lelouch and Suzaku managed to take down the Kyushu Fortress together. Lelouch went in with only the Gawain, a choice that always seemed unique to me and made this feel almost like filler. For as iconic as it is when Lelouch talks about the king leading, Zero's style is pretty far removed from charging an enemy fortress by himself with who knows what inside. This guy is allied with the Chinese Federation. Imagine if Jin Kei was in this fortress with the Shen Hu. It's implied that this is kind of a test run for the completed Gawain, and perhaps for a better approach to what Lelouch is seeking. So this surreal fanservice scene of Lelouch and Suzaku working together actually fits perfectly at this moment in the series. It's a window into what he's missing out on, a glimpse of Lelouch's life without Gios, if he didn't require privacy and was actually allowed to stand beside others. Of course, all this hope gets dashed only one episode later, when Euphemia announced the specially administrated Zone of Japan. This is fate's punishment. Lelouch had spent the entire series building up the Black Knights as a force for good, standing up for the people who couldn't stand up for themselves. By making a place where the people could be Japanese again, Yuffie, or more accurately Schneisel, forced the Black Knights to either cooperate with them or show their true colors, brilliantly defanging the rebellion. Most of the Black Knights themselves are conflicted, but a better Japan is what they'd all been fighting for. If this proposal really is everything Euphemia says it is, then they can't and won't refuse her either. This is a disaster for Lelouch. His goal had never been saving Japan, that had just been a stepping stone to his larger goal of one day confronting the Emperor. He believed Japan would be saved in the process, but this one move put those two goals at opposition from his comrade's perspective. Lelouch says the specially administrated zone isn't a sufficiently good policy, but he can't seem to convince Ogi and the others that it isn't worthwhile. He doesn't even try. Then again, he doesn't have to convince them. Everything Lelouch had built up to this point was falling apart and it all came at the hands of a sister he loved. Lelouch was once again forced to use his Gios, this time on Euphemia. He could have, and perhaps should have, used it on Euphemia back when they were stranded on Kamine Island together, but now Lelouch's hand had been forced. And while his organization toils over what they can conceivably do to realistically handle such a dilemma, Lelouch is stuck between whether he should solve this with his Gios while also plunging this world into war to bring about peace, or simply give up everything he desires in life. He did go to the especially administrated zone to deal with Euphemia alone. He would use his Gios to make Euphemia shoot him. The world would see that Euphemia's benevolence wasn't real at all. When Zero would miraculously recover, all of Japan would be behind him. For that, he would have to tear down Euphemia's plans. That was fine though. It wasn't like Euphemia really cared about this, right? Schneisel must have put her up to it. Except, she did. This was something she truly wanted. Euphemia might have been manipulated by Schneisel, but this was her vision. She renounced her claim to the throne, a consequence of her decisions. When Lelouch asks her if she did all of this for him, Euphemia tells him that it's for Nunnally, the same reason Lelouch had been doing everything too. At this point, Lelouch's original plan to frame Euphemia still would have been correct. Even if he joins Euphemia, it does nothing for Lelouch's ultimate goal of getting back at the Emperor. Yet, faced with such earnestness, Lelouch simply cannot stain it with his Gios. Of course, we all know what happens next, given that it's one of the series' most infamous moments. 
Perhaps this final moment when he rejects the Gios was the trigger. It's interesting to sometimes look at Lelouch's Gios as an almost separate entity. When C2 is giving Lelouch's Gios, she tells him that the power of the king will condemn him to a life of solitude. Looking at the series as a whole, it's hard not to see just how often that actually ends up happening. It happened more literally with Shirley, where his Gios condemned Lelouch to live without her. It happened in his everyday life, as Lelouch grew more separated from his classmates and Nunnally while living a double life. The best example of this is Euphemia. Lelouch chose to work together with Euphemia and chose not to be alone for the first time. He told her everything. He even told her about Gios. Lelouch directly went against the contract he'd accepted in episode 1, that he would walk this path separate from all humanity. His Gios activated at the literal worst time possible, to ensure that Lelouch would keep his end of the deal. Euphemia is the first to struggle against the Gios. Lelouch gave her a command so vile, even the Gios had to struggle to compel her. He saw this, saw Euphemia turn the stadium into a slaughterhouse. He killed her with his own hands a small way to atone for his sins. From that point on, Lelouch couldn't turn off his Gios. After that, Lelouch didn't share that guilt he carried ever since he first used his Gios on Shirley. Even with Colin and Suzaku, Lelouch continues playing the role of the bad guy throughout R2, not trusting them or himself enough to let them in. After his Gios goes haywire, Lelouch says that the only option he has left is to exploit Euphemia as much as he can, and the same very much holds true for his Gios. His relationship with Gios continues to endure trials until he ultimately realizes that it can change the world. If only he had used Gios earlier, things might have turned out differently. That is the story of when Lelouch stopped using his Gios, and when he decided to embrace it. If you like this content, make sure to subscribe, share this video with someone who will like it, and turn on that notification bell. Before I go, I just want to give an extra special shout out to all of the lovely patrons over at patreon.com slash kadoyt. We're super active in our patron discord server, occasionally throwing some late night anime and movie watch parties. So if that's something you're interested in, pledge just a single dollar to get an invite. You can also follow us on Twitter at kadobeyond. Links to everything will be in the description. Again, my name is Zero, this is Kado, and thank you all for listening to my dumb rants. Subscribe for more.